I'm one of Tandem Cross's team shooters, but I also have my own YouTube channel under Lawson 11B. And uh, now I make videos for Tandem Cross as well as myself. And I just got back from shooting the Arkansas Rimfire Challenge State Championship. Uh, I got back on Memorial Day, and I've got another big match coming up this Saturday. So this gun right here has had about probably five to 600 rounds through it. Our team captain, Eric Paulson, shot it for his gun as well uh, instead of bringing some down with him. So we're going to get this back up and running. And, uh, you know, it tends to perform the best when it's had a really thorough cleaning. And that's what I'm going to do right now. When I go to big matches, I do like to shoot standard velocity. And it tends to just run a lot better when it's clean. Uh, plus three round mag bumpers. Is that true? No, we make plus ones for the 2245 and Mark III. And then we have a plus five wingman for the Ruger SR-22. So before I get started here, uh, we're going to perform a safety check to make sure that we're working with a clear piece of equipment. So we're going to drop the magazine, which we've already done, and inspect the chamber, which we're clear. Now I can pull the trigger in a safe direction and pull out the mainspring. Sometimes this can be a little difficult, but once you've done it a few times, pull out the bolt. And usually I can just, yep, there we go. And looking down in here, yeah, it's pretty grody. So let's go ahead and get the grips taken off. And I can actually read the comments from the phone, so that's great. I don't think I'm going to have to share screens. Something that helps is a magnetic tray. They're kind of fun because you can just, you know, throw stuff in there. You don't have to set it down nicely. So long as it's magnetic, it'll catch it. So I like to start with the hardest gun first, which is usually the 2245. The 1022, it's pretty much a box that you wipe down. And yes, a plus five for the Walther P22 released recently. And somebody needs to hurry up and get a video for that. I'm not gonna name names. All right. So now we can see pretty pretty dirty down in there. Let's see, so something that helps a lot is a dental pick. This one's kind of goofy, so I'm going to drift out the hammer pin first, but in order to do that, the sear spring is pushing against the back of it, so you need to pull that spring back as you're pushing the pin out. So my punch was a little too big. There we go. All right. I can pull this pin out, which will let me pull out the hammer here. There we go. Safety came out as well. There's the plunger for the trigger. Now, we've got to do the same up front here for the, the trigger pin. I like to come in from this side. I test it out first to see if I can get it without reaching in there, but I usually do have to reach in there. Is this too wide to reach down and poke it? Let's see. Nope, that'll do it. All right. Let's get my little improvised punch here. Oop. So there's the spring for the plunger that goes in the trigger. So I'm going to start setting stuff in the dish here. Be really careful with the safety because the safety's got a little tiny detent and spring. And it's kind of a hide-and-seek champion. All right. So now we're going to push down on the pivot pin retainer. And we're pushing down on the trigger pivot pin to kind of let it come out of the frame here. Boy, I'm not one to get nervous, but uh, I'll tell you what. Constant pressure on this pin here. I should have been done by now, but that's okay. There we go. So now I can pull this pin out. 
kind of hidden by the thumb rest. There we go. Now I will be able to pull out the trigger bar and the trigger. And then here's a little trick that somebody told me. If you're going to lose parts, get a Ziploc bag because you can see I've got the Cane Wolf still inside of the frame. It's got its detent and spring still in there. So when you work this out, sometimes the detent and spring can just launch into oblivion. So I'm going to let them do that, but I'm going to let them do it inside of a plastic bag here because I don't have time to wait for a replacement. There we go. Bring it up to the camera and show you what I'm talking about here. This little detent is just, I mean, it's just tiny. Go ahead and put that in there. Our trigger and our disconnector. And we still have the sear and the sear spring. And these just fall right out essentially. Uh, when you're putting it back together, if you put a piece of scotch tape on one side, it'll keep that pin from falling out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they really do launch, and they're really small. So, you know, when I sweep up the trash down here, I go through it with a magnet before I throw it away. So this is a completely stripped frame, and it's pretty gross. So I'm going to start working on that. Before I do, I'm going to finish up with a bolt here. Go ahead and pull off the recoil spring. And then I'm even going to drift out this pin, which will allow you to drop the firing pin. Underneath the firing pin, you'll find this little spring and plunger. I'll put those in here. I don't think everybody should just throw their parts in a bucket like this, but if you know where they all go, uh, it it's a good place to keep them organized but if you're just getting used to <clears throat> doing this I'd recommend setting them out as they came out so uh, this is the gunsmither tool uh, tandem cross carries these what's really neat this little latch this little ring right here will let you grab the mainspring and open it without ripping your fingernails off uh, and then this helps you get it back together and this little tool you just slide it right down into your your bolt there. It allows you to easily get an extractor out of your 2245, Mark III, and 1022 bolts. So, so now we're going to depress that and kind of pull up on the plunger here. Come on. Come on. Sometimes it'll just fall right out, but of course, uh, since I'm on camera, it's going to be difficult with me. But anyways, this allows you to get inside of that extractor slot and pull it out. It is a TK extractor, yes. Yes, it is. There we go. So now, once you get your extractor out, Again, pieces that want to launch into oblivion. Underneath that extractor, you've got a plunger and spring. So you want to make sure you don't lose those. Yeah, it does happen off camera, that's true. Alright, so all this needs to get cleaned. And, uh, you know, I'm just going with stuff that I have sitting around. So this is some rim oil from Walmart. Um, this is really good stuff to, uh, you know, if you're just going to use a lot to spray down everything, this stuff's pretty cheap and it works all right. Uh, I am going to say, though, do not let stuff soak in this, like, overnight, because I did that once and I completely stained a bolt. Uh, I think it was a 2245 bolt, but if you're going to use this stuff and let stuff soak, don't let it soak for more than, I don't know, half an hour or so. So we're going to set that aside and we'll take a look in the upper here. So I do have the loaded chamber indicator replacement panel that helps with the reliability. We've got the Stripling Custom Gunworks 90 degree mount with our Seymour on there. And before I start cleaning in the upper receiver, um, I'm going to clean it dry 
because once you get it wet, you can't really go back from that. And a lot of this stuff just kind of wipes off with Q-tips. I was in the army and I learned to love Q-tips. I didn't at first, you know, I thought there was a better way, but you know, it became kind of a, uh, almost like meditation, cleaning with Q-tips, especially when you have to clean an M16 with Q-tips for 72 hours straight. You, uh, you learn to love it. And just use Q-tips when they're dry and clean out in here. Let's see, I guess we can start getting some wet Q-tips going. It's kind of nice to have a little, little ramekin. Get some of these going. So one of the places where stuff can build up is around the LCI and then the extractor cutout. The extractor cutout can get pretty full of crud. I like to do this uh, first thing in the morning when I'm drinking coffee. Um, not very often, but sometimes I'll put on music in the background. But I like to be able to set aside time where I could just focus on cleaning. Go back in the tray. Hmm. So one of the tricks I learned to get that extractor slot clean, you just <clears throat> pull off the head of a Q-tip. Now it's kind of wet, so let's pull off the head of a Q-tip. So I got some Q-tip fuzz. Now I'm going to kind of set it by the slot. This is a screwed up dental pick. And I use a dental pick to kind of stuff it down in there. How many rounds were shot since the last cleaning for this gun? Um, this gun probably had at least 600 rounds through it. Uh, I cleaned it like this before I left for Arkansas and then there was some, uh, you know, testing zero and practice and side matches and then our team captain used the gun so I through it. And, um, you know, if I didn't have a big match on Saturday, I probably would have just taken the barrel off and cleaned it a little more simply, but kind of wanted to show what a detail clean looks like and the benefits thereof, you know. So you can see there's a lot of crud on that Q-tip head. The more crud you have down in that extractor slot, you know, the more of a chance it won't grab that round or get stuck or something will happen. I'll do one more here. Bless me. Get a little wet this time. I'm going to be careful too because you can scratch a lot of stuff with the dental pick. So just get down in that slot. You don't have to be aggressive. Just, you know, get that stuff out of there. How's the view though? Is this too far away? Because I, uh, I can make it a little closer. If you guys want the extreme close-up, but I figure this is a pretty decent mix between too far away and too close. Alright, so I'm getting to the point now where there's not much left to clean. Uh, a good place where stuff can hide is kind of on this ledge right here, and then in between the sides of the feed ramp. And see some stuff hiding in the top of the chamber there. Looking pretty clean. The compensator, the compensator was pretty new. So there's, an, you can see there's a tiny little bit. And for now, I think I'm just going to leave that be. One side note though, you know, I do some of the tech requests and I get that question a lot is, you know, how do you clean your compensator? Well, you know, once it gets built up, you got to use a, you don't have to. What I use is a, a dental pick and then a punch to actually use a punch and chip it away. But uh, a compensator is a consumable, so it will need replacing. It's not a, 
a part like a hammer where it just works, you know. Um, it's going to get filled up, it's going to get loaded, and once it becomes ineffective, um, you know, you've got some cleaning options, but the, usually the best course is to replace it. I don't have a round count because it, it it's all different across all the shooters, you know. Shooting different kinds of ammo, and different frequencies, different levels of maintenance. I've never had this much of a hard time getting a boar snake apart in my life. There we go. So I'm a big believer in boar snakes. Um, they're simple to use. They work. Usually I'm just going to run it through twice. Let's see. Yeah, the game changer is great, and it's uh, it's really fun too because when you're shooting with cover, uh, it's really almost absurdly loud. It sounds like someone's shooting a nine millimeter, which is great because that means the shot timer is going to pick it up. But it's extremely effective. Uh, what makes them different from the tax soul compensators is. Uh, you know, it's not a, a linear comp, you know, when you have holes going all the way around in every direction, uh, it's not, I don't want to say it's not as effective, but when you have, uh, you know, some positioned at the 12 o'clock and the sides, it does a little bit more for you, I want to say. Uh, Jake would be the person to ask because he can actually tell you what they went through designing this and some really interesting ways that they tested it um, has to do with, uh, forget the name of the technology, but they've pushed water through it and kind of measured that. So it's an extremely effective compensator. Um, also, this is a one inch outer diameter, and that's, you know, the same size as the 2245 light. I think the Tac Sol is a 920. They may have a one inch diameter, maybe for their pack light uppers. Alright, so I've ran the boar snake through twice. I'm going to look down and just see if I can't see any any stuff in the barrel. It looks really clean. So that upper's clean. Um, as far as optics, you can use Q-tips to clean your optics, but I don't really suggest that too much because, you know, they can get stuff on it. What I like to use is a lens pen. It's a really simple uh, pen. This is you know, two to five to ten dollars depending on where you get it, but it's just meant to clean lenses for cameras and uh, you know, it's perfect for the lenses on optics because it's got a round one and then it's got a triangular one so you can get those angles. It's really important to get a GSR off the lenses because sometimes you can, you know, aim at a target, and if there's stuff all over your lens, you kind of get a starburst effect. Uh, boar snake dry. Yeah, this is a brand new boar snake. Um, usually I do put a few drops of oil uh, after the brush section, but since it's kind of new, I kind of want to wait to uh, start getting it wet. But I do have <clears throat> two separate boar snakes, kind of a wet one and a dirty one. But you can add oil to a boar snake, it does help. So that upper is pretty good. I'm going to check and make sure the compensator is still clocked, the front sight staying on there. Nothing's hanging off, optics off. So that can get set aside. So the same thing with the dry Q-tips and the cleaning. I'm going to start off with dry Q-tips cleaning the frame. And I'll switch to some wet ones. But it's nice when you have all the parts out of the frame so you can just clean, not have to worry about snagging stuff or getting little cotton fuzz stuck in there. And you can see the stuff that's starting to come out, fall out of the gun onto the carpet. Let's see, what's the difference between the Tank Soul Mag Bumpers and TK Mag Bumpers? Uh, I mean, they're different designs, uh, I think, whereas the Taxol uses a slam, and then we've got, we've got plus ones, and then we've got non-plus ones, where they're just regular bumpers, so there's a uh, little more options. 
I think tack sole bumpers are all spring assist. Okay, so that's looking pretty clean. Let's get a few of these wet Q-tips and see if we can't pull some grime out. I'm trying to think where the problem areas are, probably where these cutouts are. Cut out there, a ledge here. But once you get everything out of the frame, you can really get it pretty clean pretty quickly. is where a lot of junk likes to hide out. And you can see it's getting pretty filthy pretty quickly. I should have wiped this down with a rag before I threw it in there, but that's okay. It's going to let all this stuff lift up pretty easy. Yeah, it's a factory grip frame. Yep, I did install the Stripling Custom Gunworks thumb rest. You do have to, uh, you know, drill a hole, but... Um, it works and it stays put. I haven't had one snap off. Pretty pretty simple to install. We've got videos for that, but yeah, factory frame. I can't really afford a, a target frame. And um, you know, if I've got three to five hundred bucks sitting around, I'm getting a new gun, not a not a frame. It may change in the future, but it's just for now. So a spot that likes to hide. So a lot of stuff likes to hide down in with the firing pin inside of that channel. So what I'm going to do is the same trick I did with the extractor and behead a few of these Q-tips here. And I'm going to use my dental pick wherever that ran off to. There we go. Let me get down inside here. Yeah, yeah, they're easy to install. You know, the, the trick is to just drill that one hole right the first time so you don't have to drill it a second time. Let's see, it's pretty clean. But if you pull your firing pin up and you haven't done it before, you're going to be surprised how much stuff can hide down in here. This is really important because, you know, this is a big part of your you know, the proper functioning of your gun, if you've got this channel filled with stuff, you know, it's going to slow down the firing pin, which is then going to give you failures to fire. So it's really important to keep this as clean as possible, and I even actually like to have it pretty dry. Um, the problem if, with it being wet down there, it can actually slow the firing pin down and kind of be a magnet for uh, grabbing more stuff. So it's a good place where stuff hides and a cutout for the recoil spring right here. What I like to do for that is get a piece of cloth and run it in there. I can't really do it at this angle. You can kind of see what I mean where you make a ledge, put it down in there and run it back and forth. Actually, yeah, I usually bite it with my mouth and then secure the other end. Oh, that's a I put it in the mouth, and then it's hard, it's not hard, and then it's something like that, there you go, there you go, that's how I do it. Another spot where some stuff likes to hide out is the cutout for the loaded chamber, and it, yeah, yeah, exactly, tasty, uh, just a CLP, uh, the cutout in the bolt for the loaded chamber indicator, I'll show you, stuff likes to hide in there too. And it's not as important to clean this out since it's not really running into anything, but still, if you're going to take it down this far, you might as well clean it out. Yeah, the firing pin rebound spring can also wear out. Any, any spring that's in here can wear out. Um, I actually had to replace all of the springs in my magazines. <laughs> I, I took them apart. And the old springs were over an inch shorter than the new springs. You could literally load 10 rounds in there and then flip the mag upside down and shake it and they'd just fall out. So some of those mags have been in service for three years. So I'm glad I got them taken apart in new springs. Okay, so we've got just about all of this bolt clean. 
The last little spot I do is the cutout for the extractor, so I'm going to behead a Q-tip once again, dip it in some, some cleaning sauce here, and then run it down inside of there. And you can see it's pretty dirty, so I'm going to use a dry side this time. Do it again. Be really careful not to lose any cotton down there, because then you could start running into issues again. I'm trying to watch through the viewfinder at times, and it's, it's not as easy as just watching. Okay, so we got the bolt pretty clean. So now why don't we finish up by just finishing the bolt. So let's go ahead and grab our firing pin, a titanium firing pin. Do I ever use pipe cleaners? Uh, no, not really. I have them. I use them for the gas tubes on my AR-15, but for this, not so much. What, what can you use pipe cleaners for? Uh, for cleaning that slot from the extractor. So there's our re firing pin rebound spring. I'm getting everything that goes back into the bolt ready to go back in. Let's see. For the plunger and spring for the extractor, I do like to pull the spring off and clean the plunger and then just wipe down the spring doesn't get too dirty but you know I'm gonna take it down this far you might as well clean it right okay if I was an extractor where would I be I know I threw you in here let's see I know it looks like a hot mess but it'll all come back together there it is it's standing straight up all right now really important once you get your gun this clean no, not once you get the extractor out. You want to inspect it and make sure that there's no chips in the corners. Because if you have a chip in your corner, uh, it's not going to extract as good as it could. So it's a good time to inspect and replace whatever is not looking the way it should. Okay, so for the bolt, I'm going to go ahead and begin by putting the extractor in first. And then a little plunger go. Let's see. I'm looking for the plunger for the extractor. Durr. The scary time when you lose a part is when it doesn't make a sound and you're not sure when you lost it. So I'm going to keep looking. benefit of a titanium firing pin is it's lighter so it will be moving faster and it will also reduce your lock time which can lead to increased accuracy. Titanium firing pins are, are good stuff. Okay well I want to put that extractor in. I guess I'm going to put the firing pin in first while I keep looking for that extractor plunger. Oh, you know what? Yep, that's exactly what happened. The, it's stuck to the bottom of this when I went over the top of it. See what I mean? Even, even when it didn't fall on the floor, they can still disappear. All right, so I've got the, the plunger and spring for the extractor. I'm going to go ahead and put them in their little slot there. And then I like to make this part look like that. So it will slide over the extractor when I pop it down in there. And not get it the first time. This is one of these operations where everything could get launched into oblivion. 
All right, so we've got the extractor and spring in, and you'll notice, you'll notice when I move the extractor back, the plunger, the plunger pops down into that hole. So if you ever cannot get your extractor out or in, it's probably because this pin is still here, because when this pin goes inside of the, the bolt, it limits the rearward movement of that extractor, so you can't actually take it out. So you want to make sure that you drift it over a little bit or just take the whole thing out because it needs room to move in order to go in or come out. So that's one thing I learned way back when. Hey, Eric Bragg, I know that guy. I saw him this weekend. All right, so I've got the firing pin rebound spring and it's little, uh, it's little metal doodad. And I'm going to uh, make sure that this, this part is pointed down like that. There's actually a little cutout down here in the bolt it's going to push against. So it's going to look something like that. Now we can put our firing pin in there and push it forward. Make sure we've got tension, which we do. And then we can put this little pin back in. There we go. Firing pin works. Extractor works. What would make this complete, let's see, is getting the recoil spring on there for this guy. I like to kind of push down on it because this can get pretty dirty in here. So I'm going to push down on this, pull the spring down, and then just wipe it down with the cloth. It's not super important that this gets super clean, but it's not not important. Like I said, if you're going to pull it out, do it right the first time, because it'll make it easier next time. So get this all cleaned up. Oh wow, 36 minutes. I thought I'd be done with the pistol by now. It's okay. So I'm just going to put this back on top of the bolt. And try and speed things up here. Speed things up without screwing things up. What's going to be neat about this video too is after it's done, it'll save as a regular video that I can watch later and laugh at myself. So, hooray. Alrighty, I guess it's time to start. So I'm going to move pretty quick here. I'm going to pull out the hammer bushing. Let's go ahead and clean up the hammer. I go ahead and clean both holes pretty well with a Q-tip. And then make sure there's no grime underneath the ledge right there. Inspect for any kind of damage. I'll set him there. What is on the bottom of this? All sorts of stuff. All right. So the hammer bushing, I uh, like to rip the head off a Q-tip, go through there and clean it up. It's spinning around a pen, so any kind of stuff that gets in there can prohibit movement. So we got our hammer and hammer bushing, the trigger, pretty simple. And I'll just clean out the hole that the spring goes in, clean out the hole that the pin goes in. Probably going to have to pull the head off of this. Now the trigger gets a lot of... Uh, debris and residue on it. So when you're cleaning it, it's going to feel like you've got sand on your fingers. And what that is is a mix of, you know, unburnt powder and splattered lead. You know, the top of the trigger gets really, really dirty. So it's really important to keep cleaning it until it doesn't feel like it's covered in kitty litter. Let's see. And for the screws and the Victory, when I put these triggers in, I do use blue Loctite, and so far I haven't had any of them back out, so that's really good. Let's see, the sear. 
I like to be kind of gentle with the sear because if you uh, you know you chip that ledge, you're going to have a, a terrible trigger pull. I don't do a lot of polishing on the sears because I don't want to change the angles, and my box of shame is pretty full as is. I don't need any more fire control groups in there. That, but I do like to again pull the fuzz off of a Q-tip and then stick it through the hole and get all that stuff out of there. There we go. Let's see. Hear that creaking. Alright. So sear, so we've got the hammer, the trigger, the sear. Let's see, we got this spring. It goes inside of the trigger. And then the plunger actually goes on top of that. <clears throat> Go ahead and start cleaning our pins. I'm just kind of tossing them out as I go. safety, I want to make sure that that detent and spring stay in there, because if they don't, I'm going to have to go to eBay and order new ones or something. <clears throat> but I think this is one of the safeties I polish, too. Polished it because stuff rubs against the back side there. Alright, trigger bar. It's got some interesting shapes to it. For my gun rags, I'm just using decommissioned t-shirts. For stuff like this, the rags go a lot quicker than the q-tips. Okay. So here's the cane wolf. Still have the spring in there, so we got to be mindful of that. And the plunger is still inside of the tray. And this, you also want to take a Q-tip and clean that hole out just a little bit. And again, when you're cleaning all these parts, you're checking for damage too, making sure nothing's worn out. Let's see. I think we just got grip screws left. The sear spring. We'll start putting this sucker back together. Screws and the plunger. All right, so time for my favorite puzzle to go back together. So now I'm going to take the sear spring. We're going to make sure that this long leg of the sear spring goes against the frame like that, and it's going to go down into its cutout down there. <clears throat> There's a really wonderful set of videos. On Tandem Cross's YouTube channel that'll show you how to get something like this put back together. I think I've got one on my personal channel too that's pretty popular. Alright, so we've got the sear spring down in there. Let's go ahead and grab the sear pin. Get that started in there. Make sure that the it's going through the spring. Now we can grab our sear. Let's see here. So you want to make sure that this curved portion is facing up, like so. It's going to get a little confusing because I like to flip the gun like that so I can watch on this side and line up the spring and the pin. Slippery. That's good. There we go. There we go. Alright, so we got the... This is where the scotch tape comes in handy. You put a piece of scotch tape in there, so as you're working on it, like so, putting the safety back in, it doesn't fall out. But I've got it in there and I'm mindful of it. So next, 
going to take the safety here, make sure it's got its detent and spring. I'm going to insert it from inside while pulling the sear forward, like so. And then I'm going to rotate the safety down on top of it. And I can't see what I'm doing. There we go. Uh, trying to look around the camera here. You kind of want to be a little gentle when you're putting the sear in. Um, you can screw things up if you if you muscle things into there. So let's see. One sec. There we go. Once. Nope. Nope. There we go. All right. So we've got the safety grabbing the sear. So now what I'm going to do is take the hammer pin and just get it started in there. Let's see. So the hammer pin, I'm just gonna get it started so it'll hold it in place here. There we go. Okay. What else do we need? So now I've got the Got the hammer and the hammer bushing. The hammer bushing is going to go on the right hand side and it's going to ride in the cutout of the disconnector. Yeah, yeah, it is. The 2245 is pretty, pretty easy to get back together uh, once you figure out all the little tricks. And it can really be quite fun too, but uh, I will say that learning curve is fairly steep but once you get it figured out okay so now I've got the hammer and trigger bar in there and all that good stuff I'm gonna rotate that up I'm gonna put our spring down inside of there put our plunger in there but before I put this on here and rotate it down in there oh, everybody's favorite part all right getting that cane wolf back in there and I really hope I don't launch this little spring and plunger into oblivion because this camera is right where my face should be. So what I'm going to do is stick the cane wolf down through like that. And I'm going to have it start in its cutout. And then I'm going to push down on the plunger and spring and hope that I don't launch it into oblivion. You're going to want to use a thin punch to push it down, and I don't have one in arm's reach, so I'm going to use a bit instead. And what I'm going to do is start pushing this down while trying to rotate the cane wolf into its cutout in the frame. I don't have the as much dexterity as I used to so this is a spot where I struggle a little bit okay so we got it started again there we go so I got it in I'm gonna rotate it up like that I'm going to get the trigger pin started to hold it in place. There we go. There we go. Okay. I'm going to keep my finger there just to make sure that doesn't go anywhere. Now I can take my complete trigger with plunger and spring, put it on the trigger bar, rotate the trigger down in like so, pull it forward. There we go. Now, this, now I just need to get this pin to go in. It's pretty simple. Ta-da! Okay, nice little few bits here. There is a few things you need to do to verify that everything's working properly, and I'll show you what that is. And there's one step I haven't done yet. Let's see. Push down on the pivot pin retainer. There you go. Push it until it clicks with something besides a dental pick. There we go. Heard the click. 
All right, now, this is a spot where a lot of people forget that this is something that you have to do, but if you see the sear spring is actually in front of this trigger pin, it needs to be behind it and then pushing against this cutout. So what I'm gonna do, it's really simple to do. Poor wireless connection, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drift the hammer pin out just a little bit, and then I'm actually gonna take my pick and pull back on this spring and get it behind the hammer pin. Did I get it? Did I get it? No, I didn't get it. Like I said, I've got a camera right in my face. So I'm gonna pull back on this spring while pushing the hammer pin in. You'll hear it click, click. The hammer pin. So now if I pull the trigger, everything works. So now I can put my grips back on so none of my pins fall out. You also, yeah, you want to you want to put your grips back on, to make sure nothing falls out. So, looks like everything's good to go. That's not the right one for that, of course. And uh, you know, once you once you take this gun apart and put it back together a um, hundred times, it becomes second nature. Uh, it gets demystified. You know, it, it's kind of a challenge at first, but once you get over it, it's, it's surprisingly easy to work with. Uh, you just need to know a few of the little tricks and... Alright, not I'm losing connection for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on, but... I think, uh, I think we're going to call it quits after we get this 2245 and reschedule the 1022 for a later date. So, so now I've got a complete grip frame. What we're going to do now is we're going to put our barrel back on. This is always fun. Uh, usually you can push it on a hard surface or use a rubber mallet. Tap it on. Should be good to go. Now, take our bolt, slide it in there. And if your bolt's doing this, what you do is you actually pull the trigger and push down on the hammer. See how everything got out of the way there? Now you can put the bolt back in. There you go. Now the gunsmithy tool, this little nub right here, is so you can get it started and then get your mainspring started and pop it out. Although, yep, it wasn't back far enough. There we go. Now we're going to put our mainspring in. All right, so if this won't come down, you're gonna to wanna to pull your trigger, which will allow it to drop. If you don't have a magazine safety disconnect, you're gonna to have to put an empty magazine in here, then pull the trigger, and then remove the magazine. So now I can open the latch up, and this is where a lot of people have some problems where their gun won't reset after they get it back together, and you'll notice right there, there's no tension, no tension. What you have to do is you have to actually tip the gun up and now you'll see that because the hammer strut fell down, you can feel that tension. That tension is what powers the, the hammer and gives it that uh, power it needs. So now we've put it back under tension, closed it, closed the latch. Now it's time to do a function check. So what we're going to do is pull the bolt to the rear, make sure the gun is empty. Now we're going to pull the trigger in a safe direction and hold it. Should hear it click. Rack it. You should hear the trigger reset, trigger reset, and pull the trigger again. Boom. So now I've got a 2245 properly put back together. I uh, learned a few of the little tricks that keep it going. And then I've got six of these magazines that I'm probably going to clean. I'm just going to do one here. Uh, these are also tuned magazines. Um, I did a group magazine tuning way back when, made a video for it, and that's a big, big part of getting your gun to run 100% is having tuned magazines, <clears throat> and I'll explain that here in a second, so I'm not poke an eye out, boom, I can pull this out, oh, don't do that on me, come on now. So with a tuned magazine, 
you round off these corners right here. Um, I also polish these and then re-blue them. And you stay away from the front here because that's what actually feeds the cartridge and keeps that angle correct. And then the racetrack has been polished because this can be pretty sharp. This little follower, I actually chuck into a Dremel and then polish this channel right here because that's what rides in the racetrack and you'll hear it I mean that sounds really smooth it doesn't sound like you're dragging a butter knife on something I also polish the plunger and I think that's it so you polish the racetrack but don't sharpen it polish the racetrack polish the follower round off these corners right here and then polish the lips and then what I do is I cold blue everything so it doesn't rust and you've got a properly tuned magazine spring maybe I'll be able to show you the difference here so this is a new magazine spring I just ordered from Midway two dollars and forty nine cents I had to buy what was it, eight of them and you set this to next to an old spring and you'll see that it's actually shorter the old spring because it's been used so much is actually shorter than the new one so what was happening was with a loaded magazine it was getting stuck down at the bottom and you can just shake the mags and rounds would fall out so this is a new magazine spring and you know I'm gonna keep track of when I got it so I know when they'll need replacing but it'll let you know when it needs replacing so on to cleaning of the magazine really simple just look down in the body if you see a bunch of grit uh, clean it out. What I like to do is actually take something like this, a little piece of oiled cloth. What would be nice is to have kind of like a magazine brush like the STI guys have, but for now I'll just use recycled underwear. Uh, go ahead and get a dental pick in there. And that looks pretty clean. This follower has also been deburred because this is injection molded plastic. There were some sharp edges, so I just kind of rounded it off with some sandpaper. Let's see, so that's the 2245 magazine. This follower is pretty good. And this plunger's, yeah, everything stayed pretty clean. So let's go ahead and put this guy back together. We're going to start off by putting the follower in there. Uh, the correct way, of course. Put the follower button in the follower. Run it up to the top. Start getting the spring down in there. And what I do for the spring, because uh, if you start to compress it, it can go in wild directions. Um, if you get a punch and put it actually inside the spring, it'll allow you to cheat and get that whole spring in there without bending it in many different directions. So then we're going to take our plunger, put it inside of the spring, going to keep it captured if I can. You can't pull the spring to make it, no, no, because once it, once it's, uh, you can't pull the spring and make it longer. I mean, you can, you can pull the spring and make it longer. Wait, I need to make sure this clicked in. Did that click in? I think it did. If you pull the spring and make it longer, it will be longer, but the strength won't be there. And uh, it'll probably end up having more malfunctions than it was was already. So once they get like that, you need to replace them. There's no fix for that. It's just, uh, you know, replace it, replace it, replace it. I know I'm running kind of late, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the 1022 right now. I mean, it's right here. So... Here's a 1022. Uh, since this is a bigger gun, there we go. So we got the Tactical Solutions SBX to reconnect. There we go. So before we get started, I'm going to do a chamber check, and I'm clear. So now I can undo this titanium toolless takedown knob and move it from the stock. And the 1022 is just a joy to clean because it's just so, so simple. 
So now I'm going to go ahead and drift out my trigger trigger group pins. This is a kid single stage trigger. These are some aftermarket oversized trigger group pins. Got a tandem cross buffer. Now I can take out the bolt. And this is an uncaptured guide rod, so I need to be careful because it's not put together. Uh, blank up for the live round indicator. I can't get the factory in the nut. Do you have any suggestions? Tandem cross blank for the live round. I can't get the factory indent out. Uh, taking out the loaded chamber indicator on a 2245. Um, if it's a light, uh, they're pressed in there by the devil himself. Uh, you can't just take it out with a magnet and there, yeah, it's a light. So there's, um, there's a few tricks that you can do. What I end up doing is I just destroy the LCI. I notch the pin with a cutoff wheel and then pop it out with a flathead. What some people do is they'll super glue a punch to the pin and try and pull it out. Uh, that never works for me. The next step would be to drill a hole into the pin, flip the bit over and super glue that in place, and then pull that out. That doesn't work for me. Um, some people have uh, smacked it on a, on a rubber mallet. That never worked for me. And um, I think some people use a, a drill press. I, I don't have a good way to get it out of the light. That's why I won't do those installations. Uh, you know, at the, when we do that, it's one thing I won't do because the risk of damaging it is high. So, uh, also a qualified gunsmith's a good idea, but like I said, I just uh, destroy the LCI and rip it out of there and then notch the pin inside of that cutout, uh, being careful not to hit the receiver and then stick a screwdriver in there and pop it out. <clears throat> so this is a factory 1022 receiver uh, that's been polished. Really simple to clean. I just uh, pretty much get away with the cloth cleaning in here. And the one place where stuff likes to hide is right in here, above the barrel, and then on this ledge right here. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't be more helpful, but like I said, um, on all the other 2245s, you can just use a magnet and get them out, but for the lights, they are just like you know, red Loctite in there and pressed in with a hydraulic press. I don't know what they do, but... So now I'm getting all these little problem areas. Problem areas above the barrel and then on this little ledge right here. Let's see, I'll show you. Right here is a good spot to clean. But, you know, this is pretty much just a box. And you just clean the box. There we go. I'm going to run the bore snake through. You can put uh, stuff on your bore snake. Um, I usually do. The only reason I'm not is uh, this is my new bore snake. I've got an old one. Put a new one. Alright, so. There we go. Uh, be careful pulling the bore snake through because if the length of the bore snake is going the wrong way, what can happen is this brush portion can uh, actually go in there cockeyed like that and actually start to cause damage. So you always want to make sure that your bore snakes angle like that. You'll see it just goes straight in. But if you've got your bore snake at a at a funky angle, <clears throat> uh, you can you can pull that that metal brush in there sideways, and that's not something you want to do. Uh, let's see. This is the best way to polish the receiver. So, what I do when I'm polishing the receiver is I <clears throat> use some, um, I think, 600 grit sandpaper just to knock down the overspray. And once I don't feel any more overspray, then I wet sand uh, with, uh, what is it, 800, 1000, and 1500. And I even use uh, Dremel on low speed, no high speed ever, low speed only, with a uh, with a polishing uh, felt polishing wheel and some uh, flits or some mother's mag material. But what happens when you get it polished like this? It doesn't capture 
it's hard to get dirty and once it does get dirty you can literally just stick a cloth in there wipe it down and it's clean I mean there's no you when you feel this it's like a, a piece of ice there's no overspray uh, you know there's none of that gravelly texture in there which is really good all right so that's pretty clean uh, for my bolt, I do drift out the pin on the bolt and clean the firing pin channel. <clears throat> Although this one had that done right before I left, and this one had only shot one. I think it's only had 200 rounds through it, so I only pull out this pin and clean this channel once every 500 to 1,000 rounds or b before big matches. So, But that is something you want to do from time to time, is pull out this firing pin and clean underneath there. So now I'm getting the, the bolt face. Um, this is a really... I'm going to get that bolt face pretty clean. <clears throat> if you look down where your firing pin comes through, sometimes there will be some crud in here. And uh, right now I'm just getting it with a dental pick, but that's one of the benefits of of actually pulling the firing pin out is to be able to get all that stuff out from next to the firing pin but this should do it for now like I said this only has about 200 rounds through it but you can still see on that cloth there still quite a bit of quite a bit of crud came out from there and that spot again is just right where the firing pin comes out It's looking pretty clean and <clears throat> I don't ever really spray anything on top of the bolt because what happens is it drains down the sides so I always spray into something and then wipe it down with a q-tip you spray on top of here you're gonna end up with a soggy firing pin channel and that's not good good for business so flip the bolt over and then this is where some stuff can build up is on the underside right here the, the rifle is so much more forgiving than the pistol and that's one of the I've tried to replace the 1022 uh, as far as my comp my my primary gun goes I've tried to replace the 1022 with like a 1522 or some other rimfire rifle and I there's nothing that performs better than the 1022 for me yet there's a you can't find a lighter more reliable gun than the 1022 in my opinion and it's mostly because the way the barrel attaches to the receiver if you've ever seen the way a 1522 barrel attaches it's uh, at least something to be desired so this is my non-captured guide rod what's great about running one of these this allows you to change out the spring willy-nilly which is right here clean that uh, one thing I do polish, um, sometimes I polish the factory bolts up. Um, I do polish the top of the charging handle though because that rides on top of the bolt and then rides in the receiver. So I do like to polish that surface right there. We're going to clean this up. Kind of important to uh, take the fuzz off of a Q-tip and then clean out where this rides on the... Uh, on the charging handle or recoil assembly because this even though it'll look clean you can run a q-tip over it and just have it be filthy so we've got that pretty clean and let's see for this guy uh, yeah he looks pretty clean uh, these I like to use dry q-tips uh, a kid trigger um, you can't really take it down too far and Tony does free tune-ups on them too so alright so now it's time to put this back together will you talk about how you polished your bolt um yeah alright so I can do that for just a sec um, this is actually <clears throat> I think this is one of my older kid bolts so what I do on the factory bolts you'll see how this Bolt, bolt is radius right here uh, this one came like that but the factory bolts don't so what I do on my factory bolts is I 
actually radius the back here because that's what actually runs into the hammer and then resets it. So what happens when you radius this and polish it, there's less of a hit, stop, reset the hammer. It's more of like a smooth rolling action. So I do radius and polish uh, the back of the bolt. And then I do polish the underside too. Um, don't touch <clears throat> anything on the front whatsoever. It doesn't matter. You just touch nothing. Uh, but polish the contact points. I polish the top of the bolt right here. Polish the charging handle on top there. Polish the top here. Uh, sometimes polish the sides, sometimes not. What's the most important though is that, that radius right there. But this is a, I think this is a, not think, this is a kid bolt. And I run kid bolts and uh, JWH custom bolts. They're both really outstanding. So since this is uncaptured, we've got to put the rod in there and spring on top of it and start compressing this. Woo! And okay, so we just had one part go flying. Let's try that again. <laughs> yeah, so one downside about uncaptured guide rods is uh, you can launch them into oblivion. They do take an extra, you know, 30 seconds to install, but it gives you the ability to uh, change out change out your springs for hotter ammo or slower ammo. I just use a, a standard spring, so let's see, we're going to compress the spring. Maybe I could do this with my left hand this time. Oh, there we go. All right, now. All right. We've got the, got that compressed. Go ahead and slide our bolt down. There we go. There we go. Do something like that. And got to clean that optic too. All right, so for a function test for this guy, I'm going to charge it. I'm going to pull the trigger without it being all the way forward. Reset the trigger. Yep, it's working. The reason I do it like this is because you know, if you do it like this, you run the risk of that firing pin running into the chamber for whatever reason, uh, it can happen, but it's just easy for me to do it like this instead of like that. All right, so that's all put back together. I'm going to go ahead and throw this back in my stock. I run the Blackhawk Axiom stock with a Magpul, uh, Magpul commercial stock. This comes with a commercial size buffer tube assembly back there, kind of, so it lets you choose what stock you want. But the reason I do that is I can run a riser, which will then be at the right height for my optic, and um, it just works for me. Plus this stock with the Magpul stock and riser on there comes in at 20. Tighten down this tool, this takedown knob. All right. And the last little piece here. It's just cleaning the optic with my lens pen. Now, since these both kind of got a detail strip and clean, what I'm going to do is first thing in the morning, I'm going to go to the range and I'm going to check zero because when you take things apart and put them back together, your zero can change. So <clears throat> I'm going to go to the range in the morning and check zero and then I should be good to go. Everything is uh, back to being clean and should perform as well as it did for me down in Arkansas. Uh, well, that was a lot of fun. I was, uh, I was worried, not worried, but you know, a lot of things could have gone wrong, but that went pretty well. I guess I could do a magazine while I'm sitting here too. I'm going to be doing a, a video for the magazine takedown tool for the Tandem Cross YouTube channel. Uh, helps you tear down magazines and get them back together. Uh, for now, I'm just going to 
use a Q-tip and just uh, kind of clean the nose. This is the front of the magazine and right here is where it gets the dirtiest. Uh, what's nice about the clear ones is you can actually see stuff building up like this line right here is actually from the wax and the cartridges running into there and sometimes it'll snap off and collect on the bottom so having clear double cross magazines is really great because you know your mag change goes from you know one to two so your your time between stages can be cut down you carry less stuff with you you know, I carry three of these on my belt, which is 60 rounds, which is enough for all five strings, plus a sixth one if uh, the shot timer didn't pick something up, because I do use pretty quiet ammo. But I think that is both the pistol and rifle, as well as their magazines. Um, next time, maybe I'll do the, the buck mark or something. Or the victory but uh, both of my magazines all of my magazines for the buck mark and the victory got confiscated by TSA I accidentally went through them with them in my carry-on bag so luckily they were unloaded and uh, the great people from the old Fort Gun Club range went down there and picked them up and they're gonna mail them back to me so that happened <laughs> But yeah, I want to uh, try and do some of this live stuff more often. Yeah, well, thank you. Oh, requests. <laughs> Alrighty, guys. Well, this has been uh, the Tandem Cross TV with Brian Lawson getting his guns cleaned up for his next match. Um, my goal was to try and have this done in half an hour, and, you know, we're at, what, 76 minutes? So it ran a little long, but what's nice is, uh, you know, after this video is done being live, people can come check it out later and view it as a regular video. But, yeah, I wanted to thank Tandem Cross for letting me go live, and... You guys for signing up not signing up you guys checking it out and watching it and really appreciate it and uh as always guys thanks for watching and keep shooting <laughs>